Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar on documenting witness evidence. I'm Ellie Stevenson, and I'm an international lawyer. I have a particular interest in human rights as well, and I work at the Kosovo Tribunal in The Hague. So as you may know, this webinar is part of a series of webinars run by ETAC, which is designed to help advocates from the Falun Gong and Uyghur communities in an effort to end the atrocities being perpetrated against them by the Chinese state. As we know, these atrocities include forced organ harvesting. Also, although there is a lack of evidence at this stage, we're also concerned about the Tibetans and the, and the Christians as well, because we think they may be victims of forced organ harvesting as well. So we welcome any Tibetans and Christians who may be joining us today. So I've been working with ETAC for around two years now, and I've previously attended the hearings at the China Tribunal in London. As a result, I've listened to testimonies from many survivors of the camps and from people who have been subject to terrible human rights abuses. We're extremely sympathetic to your cause and we want to help you as much as we can. And we're trying to do this from a legal perspective at the moment because that's where we feel we can be as, as, of most use. At the moment, we're focusing on assisting in, in educating communities on the importance of collecting evidence and the importance of how to do it properly. So before we start, we've just put up a poll, which you might see on your screen. Um, could you tap on the poll and rate your current level of knowledge of today's topic, which is documenting witness evidence? And if you could, one, one is are you having no knowledge at all, and 10 is being extremely, having a high, high level of knowledge. Also, before we begin, we very much want to mention that since the last webinar in June, Nine United Nations Special Rapporteurs have raised the issue of forced organ harvesting with the Chinese government. And they said that this was in response to credible evidence that from Falun Gong practitioners, from Uyghurs, from Tibetans, from Muslims and Christians, that, that they're killed for their organs in China. So there was a letter sent to the Chinese government. And in that letter, human rights experts from the UN called on China and the Chinese government to promptly respond to the allegations of organ harvesting and to allow independent monitoring by international human rights mechanisms. So this is a major, major step forward. And it's significant because it shows that the issue is progressing. It shows that the evidence is considered to be credible. And as we expected, we haven't had a response from China yet, but we will keep you informed. So we just wanted to stress that things are moving forward. So back to the webinar, I would now like to introduce Wayne Jordash, who is our main speaker for today. He's an extremely experienced lawyer, um, and, and it's brilliant to have his support on this. He's practiced for over 20 years in the international humanitarian law, law field. He's worked in all the courts and has represented governments, military and political leaders and victims. So he's extremely experienced. Please feel welcome to write your questions that, that come to mind in the Q&A section on your screens, and we'll make sure that we've got time to go through these at the end. We're, we're aiming to speak for around 45 minutes in total together, um, which should leave us um, a good amount of time for questions. So um, I'll hand over to Wayne now. Thank you very much, Wayne. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ellie, and hello to everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar. Um, in my experience, um, one thing that's become clearer and clearer to me is that despite development um, in the way in which information and evidence is gathered, documenting remains um, largely um, connected or largely dependent upon witness interviews. Now, documentation, uh, as you will appreciate, um, is critical for a range of um, justice issues. Everything from uh, trials, of course, but transitional justice uh, mechanisms in general, truth and reconciliation commissions, um, finding missing victims, um, legal institutional reforms, and so on. 
all depend upon documentation, uh, historical records, when there are no avenues for accountability or no immediate avenues for accountability. Documentation, once again, um, critical. So documentation is almost the departure point for um, justice issues in, in general. Um, and as I say, um, the, probably the most important part of that documentation process is the um, interviewing of witnesses. And so um, that's what this uh, webinar is about. It's about some basics um, which go to how to interview witnesses, how to interview witnesses in a way which really preserves the uh, information that the witness has for the future, for future accountability mechanisms, for national courts, for international courts, um, and for the full range of transitional justice um, avenues and mechanisms that I um, referred to a moment ago. Now, taking a witness statement in a way which preserves evidence has to also ensure that the witness and the witness statement taker um, remains safe and secure. So two very important objectives. How do you preserve the information in the best possible way, in the most accurate way? How do you do that in a way which keeps everyone safe? Now, um, in my experience and in my um, career, I've played both the role of a prosecutor and the role of a defense lawyer. And it's quite useful, I think, when you're starting the question or starting to think about the question of how to interview a witness, to think of it from a defense perspective for a moment. What do you do if you're defending um, a particular accused? What do you do to analyze a particular witness statement? Uh, what do you do to try to um, pick holes in that witness statement so that you can cross-examine that witness and um, challenge the prosecution case? Well, what are you going to look for when you look at the witness statement? You're going to look at big inconsistencies. That's the first thing you're going to look for. You're going to look at big implausibilities. So. Does the statement hang together, or are there big inconsistencies? There'll always be small inconsistencies, but uh, that um, is not necessarily indicative of much. That can be indicative of um, an honest witness statement, but big inconsistencies generally indicate um, either unreliability or um, a lack of credibility. Big implausibilities. Um, Again, they indicate unreliabilities or um, a lack of credibility. And then what do you do? Having looked at the witness statement to see if there are big inconsistencies, big implausibilities, then look at that witness statement and compare it with other evidence which you um, know to be or you believe to be credible and believe to be reliable. How does it, that particular witness statement compare to the other evidence. Are there, again, big inconsistencies or big implausibilities? And then what do you do? Well, what I would do is then look at what are the alternative explanations for those events? If that witness statement uh, alleges that um, a particular victim has had uh, their organs stolen and harvested, um, is there another explanation uh, for um, critical parts of that story. Could it have been somebody else other than the Chinese government? Could uh, the uh, harvesting have been for real medical purposes? And so on. So um, part of that initial analysis is to look for alternative explanations. Now, when you've got these big inconsistencies, big implausibilities, you've compared it with other evidence you've offered or you've considered other explanations, 
then you think about how you're going to cross-examine that witness. How are you going to construct your cross-examination so that you can persuade the witness that they've made a mistake? And if mistake is not a credible explanation, then can you build up a case to suggest that that witness has lied using the big inconsistencies, the big implausibilities, the contrast with other evidence, the alternative reasonable explanation? Now, this is the type of analysis that, as a defense lawyer, you're going to go through when you see a, a particular witness statement. Now, bear that all in mind as we go through what um, the basics are in terms of taking a statement, because if you follow certain basic rules, you'll reduce the ability of the defense lawyer or of anyone um, questioning the reliability or questioning the credibility of that witness statement. So let's have a look now at some slides. Um, Ellie, please. So, pardon? Great, thank you. So, first question is whether you should take a witness statement at all. And that may sound like a, um, a troublesome question, but it's a, it's a very important question. Gathering testimony from a witness is a highly specialized activity that involves a range of legal, ethical, psychological, and security issues. Interviewing witnesses and victims without um, sticking to, adhering to basic standards can both undermine the integrity of the witness statement and also any future prosecution. And just as importantly, it can lead to traumatization or re-traumatization or victimization of the victim or witness. And so the first question you have to consider is this. Um, should you even take the witness statement? Now, you have an alternative. Um, the alternative is a witness summary. And what's the distinction? A witness statement essentially is a detailed account which comes from the witness, is signed by the witness, and effectively is owned by the witness. That statement will be used by defense lawyers, by prosecutors, by judges to assess the credibility and reliability of a witness. The alternative is a witness summary. If you feel that you do not have the capacity or the skill or the resources to take a statement, and that is often the case, um, then you take a summary. And why is it as often the case? Well, let, let's, let's place yourself, for example, in a refugee camp where you have to interview a witness, but it's important that the identity of the witness remains secret. It may be impossible. It may be impossible to create a circumstance in which you've got enough time to secure the witness's identity so that people don't know about their interaction with you. Uh, it may be that um, you don't have an office. It may be that you don't have the time and so on. So it may be better just to take a summary. And a summary enables you to quickly or more quickly take the witness's account or the four corners of the witness's account. So you get an approximation of what the witness may say to the extent that they may be able to speak to a particular incident but it's a summary, it's not signed by the witness, it's owned or remains owned by the interviewer or the investigator, and therefore it can assist the investigation because it gives the investigation or the future uh, judicial process an indication of what that witness is able to say, but without fully committing that witness to his or her account. In that respect, what that means is that the witness will not or cannot be cross-examined in the same way using the witness summary, because it's not the witness's document. It is not the witness's 
full account. It is a summary of the witness's account, and it has not been signed by the witness. So, first question, do you have the resources to be able to take a statement securely, accurately, um, in a way which produces a witness statement which the witness can rely upon, and which, when cross-examined on that statement, the witness will be able to say, yes, I said that, yes, I meant that, and the witness owns that statement. So, that's the first question. The second uh, step is, and you'll see this on slide two, contacting the witness. Um, very important, these formalities, and this, this, this is important for both taking a witness statement and also a witness summary. It's very tempting, I think, when you're trying to gather evidence, you're trying to gather information, you're trying to build a case, you're trying to bring some accountability and some awareness to a particular issue, to skip through some of these uh, formalities and, and think of them as, as, as optional. They're not. They are critical. Number one, keep a clear record of all interactions with the witness. Explain who you are and the purpose of your contacting of that witness. Inquire whether the witness is a preferred mode of communication. Ascertain whether an interpreter is needed. Uh, the, these are, you have to re remember, and it may um, seem obvious, but a witness is in a vulnerable position. It doesn't matter who that witness is, witness is. When they're approached by an investigator, whether you're a civil society organization or a, a professional investigator, a witness is in a vulnerable situation. They don't know what you know, and they don't know what you want to do. And they um, will be wondering and be worried and anxious. That is always the case. Establish whether the witness has already been interviewed by another organization. Now, one of the problems with documentation, one of the problems with witness um, interviewing, um, and this has become a real problem across many different um, uh, judicial environments or many different conflict environments, is the number of um, interviews that a witness um, ends up giving. Now, this is um, bad for a number of reasons. Um, number one, it really risks re-traumatizing a witness. If you're a, a victim of uh, organ harvesting or rape or other serious or other international crimes, um, you do not want to have to keep retelling your story to different um, individuals and different organizations. That does not, um, in the main, in, in, help a witness recover from that um, ordeal. Moreover, um, multiple statements increase the risk of inconsistent statements. If you're a defense lawyer, what you want to find out first of all um, is whether there are, as I said, big inconsistencies. First thing you want to ask, therefore, is how many statements is that witness given? Let me see them, and I'm going to sit down with those statements, and I'm going to go through them with a fine tooth comb, and I'm going to find out every inconsistency, and those inconsistencies are going to be my main weapon for undermining the witness's account. So you must establish whether the witness has been interviewed by another organization. Next. Ensure you do not promise benefits to the witness. And benefits can be um, come in many forms. They can come in many forms uh, uh, in relation to money or uh, assistance. They can come in relation to um, uh, witness expenses, um, if those expenses are too high or not strictly necessary for the purpose of attending for interview. And they will be used by the defense to say what, um, to suggest that the witness is not telling the truth. Um, it is absolutely common in all trial proceedings for witnesses to be challenged as to their account on the basis of what they received from the prosecution or from other interested parties. And if a witness receives a benefit uh, which go beyond the expenses 
uh, incurred for the cost uh, in, incurred for the attendance for interview, you will um, give the defence an opportunity to undermine the witness's um, credibility and reliability. Consent, um, again, critical, absolutely critical. And everything I've just said um, essentially goes to um, ensuring that the witness gives consent to the process that you're intending to conduct. And I, I put it broadly like that because it's consent to be interviewed, it's consent for that witness statement to be recorded, it's consent for that witness statement to be used in whichever way you intend it to be used. And so you should see consent as an ongoing process, not um, consent um, uh, one once and for all. It's consent which um, goes to however that testimony is sought to be used in the future. So if it's clear to you what the witness statement is for, for example, if it's to be going to the International Criminal Court, if it's going to a national court, if it's going to be used in a in a um, advocacy document, then you need to be specific and get that consent. If in the future that witness statement is going to be used for something else, um, then you need to go back to that witness and obtain consent. Absolutely critical to um, the integrity of the witness statement process is to ensure that the witness is fully informed as to what is going on, fully informed as to the potential use of their statement, um, and fully informed as to who may see that statement. You know, if, if that statement is going to go to an international um, court, like the International Criminal Court, or a national court, then the chances are that that statement will at some point end up in the accused, um, uh, um, the accused will end up seeing it. Because if that person is going to be a witness in the, for the prosecution, you have to disclose the evidence to the defense. And th 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 this, the witness needs to know. Um, the witness needs to understand the limitations um, that arise from giving a statement and the available protection for giving a statement so that there are no surprises in the, in the future. Um, you need to avoid a situation where the witness turns around in court and says that they don't understand what they were doing when they gave the statement and asks to withdraw it. It makes the investigators look incompetent or even worse, corrupt, and it can really impact a prosecution case. Now, this is um, the, these these formalities I've just gone through are the very basics of um, what you should do when you're contacting a witness. You should be alive to these things throughout your whole interaction with a witness. Now, turning to slide three, when you conduct the interview. Um, Emphasize throughout that you expect the witness to tell the truth. And this, 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 is, this, this is, in a sense, maybe the most important um, uh, emphasis. When I look at a particular witness statement, what I'm looking for, and I, as I said at the beginning, is big inconsistencies, but not just big inconsistencies, big implausibilities. And what am I going to do? I'm going to compare it with other evidence and I'm going to look for alternative explanations. And so a witness who is not telling the truth, a skillful defense lawyer will be able to get to that lie. They will find it. Remember, that witness has to sit in a courtroom surrounded by judges, surrounded by prosecution, surrounded by the defense with the glare of light just focused on that witness, lies come out in a courtroom. So you need to protect your witness from this moment. Make sure that they're telling the truth or try to emphasize that they should tell the truth. Encourage them to tell the truth in everything you do. I'm not just talking about saying it, but make sure that they understand you're not there to build a case. You're there to find out what happened. A witness who is telling the truth is almost impossible to cross-examine 
in a way which um, undermines their reliability or their credibility. Because in the same way that lies are exposed, the truth often manifests itself. It comes out when you're in a courtroom situation. You're not there to seek particular information or to coach them. Again, informed consent is important. And um, what you're trying to do when take a statement is to make sure that, that that truth, the details of the witness's account are recorded properly. Locations, dates and times. It's ideal if you can, it's not always possible, but if you can, use a recorder to record the interview and then transcribe it later into a statement. And that process of recording, you have something to back up that the interview took place in a proper way. Then transcribing it um, and then doing a statement. And in that process, you will be interacting with a witness and the witness can look at what they've said and consider it and consider whether they stand by it and consider whether that is the account that they want to give. That process alone, not only does it protect the witness in the future, if there is a challenge to the witness's integrity or to the in, in, in investigator's integrity, you have an audio recording to show that nothing improper happened, but also you have the process by which a witness is able to um, look and review their evidence and come to a considered view of their final statement. Consider, the wit consider asking the witness to sketch any locations onto a separate piece of paper. These can be useful um, aid memoirs and can be useful evidence um, as physical information or physical evidence. And importantly, um, let a witness lead you through their story. This is not your story. This is the witness's story. Of course, you need to guide the witness. You need to, and let's move to slide four and we'll get into then how the interview should take place um, specifically. You're not there to ask leading questions. You're not there to prove a particular case. You're there to ask open-ended questions and elicit from the witness their recollection of what happened. Um, so it seems obvious, uh, but it's often tricky in uh, practice because one, you may have been gathering a lot of information and you know what the witness is saying is, is true or you know that the witness has made a, a, a uh, simple error which can be corrected or um, you are um, determined that a particular accused or suspect um, pays the price for what they've done. But let me emphasize, um, it's really counterproductive to be asking leading questions. If a witness has been asking, asked leading questions, a skillful defense lawyer, when they look at that statement, they'll be able to see that the witness has not given their account, they've given the account which has been urged upon them by the investigator. That will be one of the things which a defense lawyer will look for as soon as they look at that statement. Is this the witness's real account? Is this the witness's um, words? Or are these the investigator's leading questions and leading suggestions? So, um, what, who? how, where, when, why. These are the questions which you should be asking. What happened? Who did it involve? How did it happen? How do you know that? Where did this take place? Where is uh, this information from? When did it happen? When was this information obtained? Why, why do you believe uh, what you've just said? If you hear yourself saying what, who, how, where, when, why, you are heading in the right direction and you're giving the witness a chance to uh, give their account. Like I say, not that you don't have a role to play beyond that. Um, your role is to guide the witness to ensure that the witness is focused on the relevant issues. Um, a witness will want to talk about many things and at some point uh, you will have to 
perhaps allow them to speak about some of the things which are not as relevant as others, but at some point you have to focus the witness's attention on the things which really matter, and the witness may not know what really matters. Um, in terms of the case that you're hoping to build or the um, elements of the crimes you're hoping to establish and so on. So your role is to, yes, ask open-ended questions, but to ensure that the witness is able to position themselves in relation to the issues you want to consider. So um, slide five, um, what are the essentials? The essentials that you have to ensure are encompassed by your um, interviewing questions. Number one, identification. The witness needs to identify all the persons and events with care, including their own details and their own role. That's something to pause on. A witness needs to talk about what they did too. Um, any suggestion that they're hiding what they did for whatever reason is likely to give a defense lawyer a chance to undermine their account. Witnesses who want to talk about um, others but won't talk about themselves will be taken as an indication that they have something to hide. Useful to question the witness in the safety of your interview rather than that being exposed in a courtroom later on. Story, and this is maybe the most important thing about um, what you must try to include in a witness statement. You need a chronological explanation of relevant events. The events that they witnessed relevant to the investigation, whom they saw, where and when they saw them and what happened. Identification of the perpetrators and a full description of their physical characteristics, including their uh, clothing and vehicles. Words spoken by the suspects and other relevant people. It's really important, I think, to, to think about um, the culture that you're dealing with. Um, different words are used by different people. Different um, words have different cultural meanings. Um, Ellie will touch upon this in relation to her Darfur case at the ICC. But it's quite a complex area, this, in some ways. Um, for example, you know, a case I did in uh, Sierra Leone. There was no point asking a witness um, what the month was um, or um, how many people there were in a particular group. People in Sierra Leone um, generally think in terms of the dry season or the rainy season, not in terms of spring or summer or uh, January, February. It's the dry season, it's the wet season, it's the rice season, it's um, various other agricultural um, determinations. When you ask a witness in Sierra Leone how many people were in a particular group, they will often say not many or many. And trying to pin them down to a particular number is, a, is an exercise uh, which is pretty tricky. So be very conscious of the culture that you're dealing with, the words that are signifiers of, um, or the words which are used to describe uh, different um, uh, important events um, and, and cultural differences which can be broad and um, very um, different across the globe. Finally, thoroughness and ethics. Thoroughness. Um, I, I think it's sort of implicit from what I've just said. It's really important to be thorough with a witness. And this goes to the question that I raised at the beginning. Do, do you have the resources to um, conduct the interview in the first place? If you don't have the time, if you don't have um, the, the knowledge, to be able to explore the gaps and inconsistencies in the story, you're almost certainly better not to take that witness statement because you'll take a statement which doesn't include all the relevant details and things which are missed out, inconsistencies in the story which you haven't discussed with the witness will in the end give the defense 
attempt to cross-examine the witness in a way which undermines their account, and it may not be their fault. Finally, ethics. Um, do not rehearse an interview with the witness. Do not tell the witness what to say. Do not record only the part you want to hear. You must collect evidence ethically, that is, honestly. Um, let me, at this point, hand over to Ellie, um, and we'll return to other issues um, during the Q&A. Um, Ellie will talk about how to actually record all this information on paper. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Wayne. Um, so once you've conducted the interview, you need to record the information, of course, somehow have a record of it. So what I'm going to do is provide a list on the following slides that you can keep with you and refer to as you're writing a statement. So bear in mind this is for a statement rather than a summary. So as Wayne said, if you're doing a summary, just make sure you record the broad outline of what the witness says. Don't ask the witness to sign it and keep that, keep that record of information that you can later pass to an investigator because it might not be that you might not be around in several years' time. These investigations go on for a long time. So that, that summary can become useful later on. So in terms of taking out a proper full statement, so first of all, record their name and age at the top of the statement. Record where you're taking the statement from, the, the, the location. Think about and ask the witness, does their identity, i.e. their name, need to remain confidential? And I think in a situation such as yours, I think they probably do because you are, you're doing an investigation against the Chinese government in relation to allegations of forced organ harvesting. So there probably are big issues of confidentiality here. Please record the contact email and phone number. Again, you might not be involved later on, so it's important that anybody that gets hold of, of your statement or your summary, that they know how to, how to contact that witness. Record what languages the witness speaks. That can be helpful for, for subsequent investigators and, and judges. Um, and also ask them what their background and ethnicity is and their occupation. But those sorts of questions are designed to help judges because they, 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 it teaches them about the witness, who they are, and, and it gives them, gives them an idea, is, is that witness like to be honest or is there a motivation to be biased? So you record all that information at the beginning. And then getting onto the body of the statement, what you want to record is a chronological sequence of events, identification of all perpetrators. Wayne touched on this, but think about any identification, identifying features of, of, of the perpetrators. So think about if you have a if you have somebody conducting medical tests, for example, in a medical facility, how do you prove that they were there and how do you prove that they were doing those medical tests? That individual is always going to say he wasn't there or he's going to say prove that I was there because it is, he's right, it is up to the prosecution, i.e. us, to prove that he was there doing those medical tests, committing those crimes. And so you want to end up with evidence, things like, if you had 10 witnesses, it says, well, this, this guy doing the medical testing had a strange walk and he, and he wore a, green, a dark green uniform, then that, that is very helpful. So always ask for identifying features, things like a distinctive walk or a distinctive facial feature, or did, did the perpetrator carry a distinctive weapon? Did they use certain words or phrases? So then, then you need to ensure that you record a comprehensive description of all the crimes witnessed. Include descriptions of the scenes of each crime they talk about. As Wayne said, you could you can ask the witness to sketch certain crime sites. So again, if you have 10 sketches of sim the same thing, then it's likely that that crime site was like that. Actual words spoken by the suspects. So here, if you, certain words are used by certain people, obviously, and they can be unique to that person, and that could be very useful. So in a case that I did at the International Criminal Court on the Darfur situation, there was an individual who led um, a militia, and he always said before issuing, or as he ordered a, an attack on a village, wipe and sweep and clean away. 
and, and what he was saying is kill all the villages. But then we had several witnesses that said there was always this individual there that said wipe and sweep and clean away. And so we there we knew that that was Mr. Kushabe because we knew Mr. Kushabe said that because we had another another witness that linked that phrase to his name. So always ask witnesses for words that were spoken by the perpetrators. It can be really useful. Also ensure that in the statement you make it clear how the witness saw or heard things. For example, how far away was the witness when he witnessed a crime taking place? Was he right next to the event or was he three football pitches away? Of course, if he was next to the event, it's more the evidence is more reliable. Also, we'll think about was it was it light or, or was it in the dark? Always make it clear again if the witness is giving direct evidence, i.e., that he saw something himself, or if it's hearsay. Both are, both are good, but just make it clear in the, in the statement. So I saw the murder happen, or my friend told me when he came back to the cell that he saw this event happening. Ensure that the statement is written in the first person, I saw or I did. Okay, so once you, once you have everything documented, you need to make sure that the witness is happy with, with how you've written down their account. So ask them to read the statement and ensure that they fully understand it. So if an interpreter is needed, get an interpreter. If the witness disagrees with any information, redraft that part of the statement in line with what the witness says. Ensure that the witness signs it and an investigator signs it. Note down anyone else who is present as well. Be as transparent as possible and record the date and time. Just to flag some things that people do, um, it might seem obvious, but make sure you have a plan as to how you conduct the interview and make sure you understand other relevant evidence. Make sure you understand the situation so that you can ask probing questions when somebody tells you about disappearance or a medical testing site or the arrest. Make sure you understand that vaguely how those processes work so you can ask probing questions. If you don't believe what the witness is saying, or you think they're lying, or you think they're saying things to, to impress you, or if there's something that makes you feel that the account is not reasonable, challenge them on that. Can't underestimate the importance of doing that. Record everything that they tell you. And importantly, write down things in their words and not yours. You've got to imagine that this witness eventually, potentially could be on the stand in court, and he's going to be speaking as he speaks. And the way he speaks needs to be the same as, as the statement. Otherwise, it looks a bit odd. Incons inconsistencies, if you see there are inconsistencies, go back to the witness and ask them to explain them. That's absolutely fine to do that. So a note on safety. Bear in mind, as Wayne said, there's risks to vi victims and witnesses in cooperating with these investigations. There might be intimidation, intimidation techniques or threats by perpetrators or their families or their communities towards the witnesses. There might be punishment inflicted on the witnesses. They might be arrested. They might be re-traumatized re from having to give their account again. They might, there's a threat of loss of livelihood. So there are serious repercussions as a result of cooperating with these sorts of investigations. So please, every time you're taking a a statement or doing an interview, have that, have that firmly at the front of your mind. So to minimise risks, um, keep confidential witness information, i.e. their name and contact details, in a secure location separate from the witness statement. You can give a pseudonym to the witness and you can put that on the statement or any recorded evidence and keep that in one place and then you keep their details with the pseudonym in a secure location. So if anybody gets hold of that document, the statement, they can't see who is giving that evidence. Never share information about victims or witnesses with other witnesses or third parties, no matter how tempting it is. So you might interview a group of people and just try, when you're doing it, to not say, oh, I interviewed your friend yesterday or so-and-so gave me your contact details. Keep everything confidential. Use secure communication devices such as Signal, if you think there's a risk to a witness, don't record the image or voice of a witness. Ensure that the witness is, com um, is, is comfortable in the interview location. And as Wayne said, 
only question them as much as you have to. Ideally, they would do one interview and, and that would be it. In, in practice, that doesn't happen, but try to limit the times that you, you do an interview and other basic techniques such as wear plain clothing at meetings. Don't draw attention to yourself. So that is your basic outline. We hope it's helpful. But I've had to think about what you might be able to ask people um, specifically in your situation. So I'll go through these slides quickly and you can keep these for when you conduct your interviews. So remember, always ask open questions. It's so important. Don't put words into their mouth. The witness needs to be able to recall their statement in court and they won't be able to do that honestly if you have guided them how to say things or if you put things in different, word, in different words. So again, you won't be able to have a, a pre-planned list of questions because you need to have an idea of the situation. You need to listen to what they say and then ask probing questions. You have to be prepared to do that rather than having a set list of questions. So we can go from the beginning of, of a person's ordeal, which would usually be a rest at their home. So you can say, were you ever placed in detention? If yes, ask probing questions. Where, when, for how long? What was the name of the detention facility? Could you describe to us how you ended up in detention? So you wouldn't go in and you wouldn't say, we know it was Mr. X who, who, who arrested you, wasn't it? And they placed you in this particular prison. You wouldn't ask questions in that way. Ask who arrested you? What were they wearing? Who do they work for? What did they say to you? What were their reasons for arresting you? Did they give you official documentation? We know that often, usually never, there was, there's never any documentation given to them, but just ask, do, do you have official documentation, even though you know the answer is no? Was there a court process? Again, you already know the answer, but ask the question. Medical tests. Ask open-ended questions. Try to ask questions without asking the di a direct question about medical tests. So, for example, what happened to you in detention? They might say at some point they took us to a medical facility so then you say what did they do to you in a medical facility what equipment did you see what did they say to you about the procedure how many times did it happen what did they look like ask about identifying features sketch the room what was the procedure called so if they say they did a scan you don't say oh they scanned your liver didn't they they scanned lots of people's livers you, you can say can you point to me where they, where they scanned again an open open question do you know if anyone else had the same tests and examinations? Did they do anything else? As regards forced organ harvesting, you absolutely ask about this. Have you heard of it? Have you heard of forced organ harvesting? If they say no, that's the end of this section. You can't ask them anything else about it. You can't try to persuade them that they know about it. That would come across in any cross-examination. But if yes, probe. When did you hear about it? What did they say about it? Was anyone else present? Describe what happened, or did you witness anything that you thought may be related to forced organ harvesting? Please describe in detail. As regards people disappearing, we know that that happens, it's a common occurrence, but again, what happened to people in the detention centre? If, if this doesn't give the answer that people were disappearing, ask other questions where you think this might lead someone to say that people disappeared. How many people were in your cell? Was it always the same number? Did you have any friends? They might say, well, I did have a friend, but they, but they disappeared and never came back. Or there were 40 people in my cell, but sometimes it was 35 because overnight five people disappeared one, one, one night and we never knew what happened. So you can say, do you know where they went? What age were they? What ethnicity were they? Again, please describe what happened. Torture, again, open questions. You can use the questions on this slide. Ask, first in this situation, what words did the torturers use? They'll often use the same words over and over again when they torture people. Okay, as we know, it's predominantly Falun Gong and Uyghurs who are detained. 
and targeted for their organs. And by showing that the camps are mostly occupied by these people, it goes some way in proving the targeting of these groups. And that's something that you need to do. So you can ask, who are the detainees? How do you know they're Falun Gong? A judge needs to know that the witness isn't just assuming that they're Falun Gong, that they have reasons to believe that they're Falun Gong, such as that they used to practice Falun Gong in detention, or they told me they were Falun Gong. You ask how many, how many Falun Gong detainees were there? Do you know why they were there? Did you see anyone else being detained in the detention centre other than Uyghurs and Falun Gong? What's their ethnicity? So these are all open questions. Again, at the end, at the, at the end of the interview, always ask them if there's anything else you'd like to include about what happened. They're likely to, to tell you things that you weren't expecting and note it all down. It's very, very important you get a full, full picture of what happened and you record everything. Of course, ask them if they know names of the guards or officials responsible. Ask them to include whatever details they can. So that, that's our advice, very basic advice on documenting evidence. And I just wanted to say, remember that it's a skill interviewing somebody and people make whole careers out of it. And don't worry if you don't get it right immediately. Judges are, they just apply common sense. If they're seeing that the interviewer was someone from the community with no experience of conducting an interview, they will be more lenient on, on those people and on those statements. So don't think if you don't get it right that the, your, your evidence is not useful because it, it will be. Your evidence can be useful in other ways than, than, than being used as a statement. It might produce a lead. So don't underestimate how much you can help. We're trying to show you the best way of doing things, but it doesn't mean it has to be perfect. So for now, I'll stop showing my screen and I think we have time to do some questions and answers. Okay. Okay, so let's go let's go to the questions. So I can see a question here. Can a recorded testimony be used in court? e.g. if the person was still in China and cannot attend court in person or online? Um, the answer to that is yes, there are rules for each court and they're all slightly different, but that the court does make allowances for that sort of situation for various reasons. You can either have a person that does video, a video conference and does it live and it can be cross-examined live, or there are certain times when the judge will allow video, somebody, an investigator, to go in and record that evidence and to be used subsequently. I don't know, Wayne, if you want to add anything, but that's definitely, it's definitely something that's possible, isn't it? Yeah, def definitely possible. I mean, um, much, much will depend upon um, how um, close the testimony is to accusing um, the suspect or accused rather of a crime so it's absolutely normal for testimony which goes to context to be admitted in the at the at the international level and i think also in many national jurisdictions and the question for international courts is um often do, does the evidence go to the acts um, and conduct of the accused. And the more it goes to the acts and conduct of the accused, i.e. the more it's going to be the basis or could be the basis for conviction, the more difficult it will be to admit the evidence without the person in the courtroom. But it doesn't mean to say that um, even if it goes to the acts and conduct of the, accused, of the accused, it will not be admitted. For example, if a witness has died, it's often admitted, um, despite the fact that the witness has died. Um, and um, if the witness is being kept away from the courtroom by um, people who have an interest in undermining the prosecution, um, then 
the judge will look at those circumstances often and decide whether the interests of justice still um, mean that the statement should be admitted and then um, caution is exercised over accepting um, the evidence. So what that means is um, the evidence will need to be corroborated for it to be accepted if the witness or sorry if the accused has not had the opportunity to cross-examine the particular witness on that testimony. So the answer is, uh, is yes um, but um, with caution. Yeah and, and just to add to that the logic behind that is, is that the judge wants to protect the defence. So if a person's not standing in court that means that they can't be cross-examined by the defence. So where you have somebody that's been recorded and then doesn't come into court at all or isn't on video conferencing in China, that could be seen as less reliable. But of course, it's looked at on a case by case basis. But if you have someone in China that can't travel because for whatever reason, because they're ill, or they can't afford it or they have other commitments, they could they can essentially zoom in. They can zoom in. This happens all the time now. And then they can be cross examined. So there are lots of ways that it can be done and, and really they just the judge needs to weigh up the, the prejudice to the accused versus how valuable the evidence is to the prosecution. I hope that's helpful to that question. Okay, here's another one, Wayne. Perhaps you'd like this one. What should I do if I sense the person I'm interviewing is making something up and not being truthful? That's a great question because um, I think there's often, I think even even, even with um, the most innocent of victims, there, you know, life is complicated and uh, witnesses prefer to speak about one thing and not the other, um, all the way to some witnesses just being determined to, to lie. Um, that's the, the messiness of a court process and I think um, what you need to do is approach the um, taking of a witness statement with, with a healthy um, degree of inquiry. I was going to say with a healthy degree of skepticism but I think that's too far. I think a healthy degree of inquiry um, and that means um, if a witness is obviously um, lying and sometimes it's very obvious, then um, that needs to be put to the witness in a way which um, uh, makes it clear to the witness that such lies will um, not um, help them nor help the person that they're seeking to help with those lies. What, what, I, what I often do when I have a witness who I come to the conclusion is, is lying, I will say to them, uh, look, this, this, this case is going to um, the International Criminal Court or this whichever court it's likely to go to. Uh, whether it's a judge uh, who will be considering the statement or a jury, and I, I say to the witness, do you put yourself in the judge's uh, shoes? Uh, put yourself in the jury's shoes. Do, do you really think the witness, the, the, the judge or the jury is going to accept this or believe this? Or do you think that um, they're going to think that you're lying? And usually, not always, but usually that has a sobering effect on a, on a particular witness. When they begin to picture themselves in the courtroom telling that account, um, and of course, you know, as part of that trying to put the witness into the future position of being in, interrogated in the courtroom, you can, of course, highlight to them why you think that they're lying. There's nothing wrong with that, as long as you're not um, coaching the witness or rehearsing the witness's account, but you're just pointing out certain common sense pieces of um, reality, if you like, that mean that the witness's account is going to be exposed and when they go to court they're going to be exposed and they're going to be embarrassed and usually gently sometimes firmly and sometimes forcefully a witness will understand that their best interests are not to continue with that lie. 
Yeah, absolutely agree. Okay, I can see lots of questions now. Um, at the UN, what is the policy of providing information, identities of witnesses to essentially China, to, to the country, so China? I think, I think Wayne, this, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, it's from Jenny. Um, I think, I think we're talking about witness protection issues here, probably. Um, mm -hmm. So, at the ICC, what happens is the prosecution apply to the judge to protect witnesses of, of witnesses that they feel are at risk. Um, and the judge usually, obviously, there's a weighing up balance process to the as to regards to the prejudice to the accused, but they will grant them protective measures, and that and that will put that that will protect those witnesses. It will mean that the witness identities, i.e., their name and lots of other identifying information, such as where they work, where their house is, anything that the defence could use to work out who they are, that would mean that that wasn't disclosed to the defence. Maybe Wayne could touch upon what other protective measures there are as regards them being relocated, because I'm sure that that does happen as well. But it's at the discretion of the court whether the identities will be protected so again, that's something that when you're taking a witness statement from a person, you need to say that it is at the discretion of the court whether to grant them that anonymity. And mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, it, it's what, what what's important, I think, to keep in mind is um, what are, what are the objective um, risks uh, to that witness to their um, privacy to their safety and security and what, what are the objective risks to their friends and family? And secondly, what are the subjective uh, risks also? So um, what does the witness feel is the risk to them, which, which may be different to what, is the, what are the objective risks? So a witness can be very sensitive um, and believe that there are risks which maybe are not borne out by objective um, realities. But when you're taking a witness statement, what you're interested in is what does the witness feel are the risks? Because the witness is, 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 is likely to be able to give you really valuable information which um, will enable the objective risks to be ascertained in due course. And that's what the court will be interested in. What are the objective risks? And if they come to most, well, at least international courts, and, and I would have thought many national courts, um, and certainly the UN will always be interested in this. What, what, what are the objective risks and what can be done to confront and address those risks? And Ellie's spoken about some of those uh, measures that can be taken. So you've got a full range of protective measures which are taken by international courts, ranging from uh, one, um, the name of the witness being um, uh, redacted. redacted. Uh, but, but, but let me just emphasize this. It, at some point, that witness's identity will be known to the accused. If the witness is going to testify against the accused, international courts, UN courts, do not allow anonymous witnesses. So the witness's identity can be hidden from the public, but at some point it will be given to the accused. When they testify, a witness's identity can be hidden from the public. They can give evidence behind a screen. They can have a voice distortion so that nobody can hear their account. And when they give evidence which would identify them, for example, if they talk about where they live or um, who their friends are and so on, uh, information which would identify them, then the courts will go into what's called a closed session so that only the people in the courtroom can uh, hear that evidence. And then in the most serious cases, if the witness's um, uh, identity is uh, to become known to the public or even known to the accused, 
then the witness can be relocated um, to another country with themselves and their immediate family. And that's, that happens uh, fairly regularly, although it's the most extreme form of protective measures. So I think for the, for the, for the purposes of taking a statement, um, it's really important you include in that statement what the witness's view is about their um, security or privacy, what they want to remain um, redacted and hidden. But it's also, um, as Ellie said, very important that you make it clear to the witness that um, in the end it's for the court to decide. It's not for the prosecution to decide, it's not for the defence to decide, it's for the court to decide. And what I would suggest is um, that you would include in a witness statement um, the fact that a witness uh, wants that discussion to be had with them before their identity is disclosed to anyone um, outside of, um, say, the prosecution. That, that will give a witness an extra sense of security that they're going to um, be able to give inf informed consent. And it will mean that um, uh, the witness um, is um, able to participate um, more in the overall process and so will feel more comfortable giving you their account when you're interviewing them. Yeah, and just, just one thought that came to mind. This sort of issue is likely to stop a large number of witnesses from giving evidence, of course, because they're scared. Yeah. But what you can do in this situation is include in the statement, or you, or you could say to the witness that they they can give the evidence, but only on the condition that that evidence is used to produce leads, i.e. The, investi the investigator can extract information from the witness, but that evidence is only so that the investigator can go and find somebody else to talk to. So they can tell, they can the witness can say, oh, for example, my family member, something happened to them, or my sister, or my friend, go and speak to them but please don't give my statement to anybody else. And then the investigator won't give the statement to anybody else. And then the prosecution can't disclose it to the defence, the defence can't demand it. So that's something to bear in mind. If you have a witness that's saying they don't want to be, participate in proceedings, that, that, that that's a, a second good option. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question. Should we systematically note or record our questions during an interview to show our impartiality? Yes, absolute yes from me. I'll let White Wayne talk about this more, but absolutely yes. And sometimes your questions will be requested or often will be requested by the defence so they can scrutinise them. So yes, you should just note them all down. Um, I, 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 w I would say that um... Um, you, you should, I, I would slightly nuance what Ellie said, and um, you know, it, it can be very difficult to write down every single question because you know there might be lots of details, and you're asking lots of okay. questions. But, mm -hmm. but, I, but I, you know, I think that you need to. I think what what Ellie discussed about having a plan, for example. So you have a, you you, you need to be able to. I think you. you well, you need to be alive to the fact that you may be, as an investigator, challenged later for being um, biased. Um, and so you need to take a sensible view as to what um, notes you should take to be able to um, confront such allegations later. And so um, taking a good plan which you could produce if necessary to show um, that you were approaching things in a in a in, a, in an unbiased and um, inquiring way. Writing down your um, overall subject areas and maybe overall questions, but don't um, don't 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 panic if you don't have every question written down. You know, um, but just make sure that you have sufficient. Um, preparatory notes and sufficient records of what happened to be able to show that you were alive to the fact you needed to be partial, you were in fact impartial, and you had nothing to fear from um, disclosing um, those um, records. 
Exactly. It's, it's striking a balance between showing that you're impartial and not telling them too much information, because whatever information you give them, they will try and twist that. So that's, that's your justification for not disclosing absolutely everything, because you're going to have people on the other side that are being slightly unfair or playing a game often. So you just have to strike that balance. Yeah, and I, I would also add, to, I absolutely agree with that, Ellie. I mean, you know, there are many, let me, let me just go back a bit. I think th there is a distinction between um, internal work product, um, and which you don't have to disclose. So, for example, you're interviewing a witness, and you come to the conclusion that the witness is not telling the truth. And you want to make a note of it for your own purposes. Um, that internal work product, and you do not have to disclose that. That's your view, and that is something you might give to a colleague when you sit with the rest of your investigation team. You sit with the um, other um, people involved in your documentation process. That's for your private discussion. You don't have to disclose that to anyone. Um, so you need to make a distinction between the internal work product, which is your private observations, and in that sense you want to keep a separate record of, of those um, notes, and then a record which you are prepared, if you need to, um, to disclose to um, whoever. And that record of notes which you'll disclose to others will will have, for example, the questions you've asked. They'll, they'll have, um, you know, um, maybe um, notes about evidence that you've made which you want to ask the witness about. Um, they, they will not include the confidential um, internal working records which are necessary for you to conduct your investigation, but are not necessary to um, be able to demonstrate the um, honesty of your investigation process or the um, uh, the honesty of the witness you know th that's the distinction keep you should keep in mind yeah absolutely okay and um, here's a here's another question from the witness's perspective is it better to be Selective who they to who they tell their story. I mean, for example, some well, a lot a lot of people want to get as much media coverage as possible. I guess I, maybe that's one for you, Wayne. I guess it's. I'll, I'll leave that to you, Wayne. I think. You know, the the question is, I'm, I'm not sure I follow the question. What's so, the issue? so so from a witness perspective. Should they should they be selective who who they tell their story to? Um, what's often happening is that they people are speaking to as many people as possible, trying to get as much media coverage as possible. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, it's a very it's a very good good, good question, and I, a very good question, and I think it's also um, one of the most important questions of modern day interviewing. Um, you know, if, if 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 you go to, for example, Cox's Bazaar, where um, there are a million Rohingya refugees who fled um, at various stages from uh, Myanmar because of the military um, and the crimes they've committed against them, and if you um, go there and you start talking to witnesses, you'll find witnesses who've been interviewed. 20, 30 times by different organizations. Um, and, you know, you have to deal with the reality that many of those have been interviewed by journalists who are not interested in um, uh, a court process. They're not interested in um, taking um, a statement for the purposes of um, uh, accountability. They're interested in raising awareness and a headline. And I don't say that in a judgmental way because journalists play an absolutely critical role in highlighting um, atrocities and crimes. And they're absolutely necessary to the justice um, effort. Um, but I think, you know, it's very important for a witness to understand um, what they're doing and what is going to happen to their statement um, and be. Um, 
mindful that um, a journalist may come and take a statement, um, but nothing else but an immediate headline may result from that um, telling of the story. So if you're a, a, a rape victim or a victim of harvest, uh, organ harvesting, and you're understandably seriously traumatized, you might not want to tell that story just for a headline. You might want to save that story for the prospect of a judicial process. And so I think who, who you tell the story to is very important. And I think it's very important to many witnesses to have some autonomy and some agency in terms of choosing who they tell that story to. And one of my frustrations um, in, in the human rights world is, is how few interviewers, whether journalists or um, uh, civil um, society activists, properly inform a witness what's going to happen to their story. And witnesses are left believing that they've given their account and something's going to happen, and actually nothing's going to happen. So I think it's one of the most important uh, parts of, uh, of, of, a, of a witness interviewer's job is to properly inform a witness what is and what is not going to happen with their statement. Um, I think that is absolutely crucial to protect a witness. And, and to give a, a, a witness the right to consent to that interview. Um, not, nothing or very little is gained from a process whereby a witness um, gives a statement believing that their statement is going to lead to some kind of real accountability. And in fact, it's just a journalist who wants an immediate headline. Um, some witnesses may be grateful for that immediate headline, but the, the um, the starting point is the witness has to be able to give informed consent. Absolutely. And another thing to, to take into consideration when giving statements to lots of people is, as we touched on in the, in, the, in the presentation, that they need to make sure that they give the, exactly the same account to everybody. And they've also to think about how the journalists are going to report that account, because we don't want to have lots of inconsistencies um, arising from one one statement. So that, again, is something to think about. How trustworthy is the journalist? Are they going to be able to see what they report before they report it? Those sorts of considerations. If the interview with a witness is in a language other than English, is there a requirement for standards of translation and verification of translation? So, yeah, I mean, there will be translation of it in, in proceedings, um, and that, that would be done by the prosecuting body, wouldn't it, Wayne? It would be done by the prosecuting body, um, and there are always arguments between the defence and the prosecution about the translation. So in that sense, it's, it's very well monitored um, and it's not just something that's brushed over. I don't know if you want to add anything, Wayne? Yeah, I mean, I think you know the the the, um, the important thing is that to you know get the best possible translation you can. I mean, it's not um, it's not important. It's not it's not critical, and it's not possible. In fact, in re in in re reality, to always get the most perfect um, translation. Um, and what, what is the most perfect translation is going to also be a matter of debate. Um, so it's quite normal for a court to be debating um, the, um, the, 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 the um, reliability of a translation. And, and, and a lot can, and can turn on it, in fact. You know, um, I've had a case where the accused was alleged by the prosecution to have said, um, that a particular perpetrator had come to a particular area and committed crimes. And the prosecution said that the accused had brought him, brought this perpetrator to this area. And in fact, when the translation was done, what the accused had said was um, the, the, this perpetrator brought himself 
do this particular area. So on the one interpretation, the accused was completely guilty or likely to be guilty. And on the other, he was absolutely not guilty. So um, having a good translation is important, um, but the re practical realities mean that the, you will always be arguing in court as to what is the correct interpretation. So um, get the best interpretation you can, but don't, um, don't um, forego or don't give up um, a, a witness's account because you don't have the best translation. Just get the best one you can um, and uh, try to work with that. Okay. I can see if you have any more questions. We've done many of them. That's actually all questions. If anyone else has any other questions, do type them in. Just while I wait for some more questions, <clears throat> I'll just run through <clears throat> some final notes. <clears throat> Uh, a video will be circulated of this webinar in the next few days, so you'll have a record of it and, and we'll circulate the slides as well. Please, please do share it with your community, share it with as many people as possible. Um, there's also, there'll also be a link to ETAC's new flyer, um, which you can use in your advocacy if that's something that you're, you're doing. Um, and you might be able to see it now or, or shortly you'll see a, another poll on your screen if you could fill that out that's just in respect of your knowledge after after the webinar and um, again i think one is no knowledge at all hopefully you do have some knowledge now after the webinar and one is having a lot of knowledge all right so I'll just check if there's any more questions if not we can we can leave it there I think that's all questions. So, Wayne, unless you want to add anything, um, thank no, you. For... Okay, I would like to just add one thing that I think, yeah. and I think it's what you said, Delhi, um, which yeah. is, you know, this is not an exercise in um, perfection. It, it's an exercise in trying to um, do the best you can to get the, the most um, understandable, accurate, account and nobody's perfect you can do this for 20 years and you will still make mistakes the important thing is just to be take a common sense approach to um, accurate narration of an account which best protects a witness at the time you're taking the statement and at the time that they're going to be cross-examined in a courtroom so um, just uh, bear, bear that in mind um, don't let um, perfection be the enemy of good. Exactly, exactly. Um, otherwise, thank you for attending, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be helping you. We hope we can help you as much as possible. Um, if you end up taking a statement soon um, or at any point have questions, please contact ETAC and, and they can contact us and we can, we can try and help you formulate questions um, or help you write up the statement. Um, and that just leads me to thank Wayne. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, it's brilliant to have you. Thank you very much. And I'm sure everybody really appreciates your input. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to, to be involved. Okay, thank you everybody. Goodbye.